Hi, it's nice to have you. It's been really good, I really enjoyed it. Was I the only one that got massively distracted in Jessica's talk from trying to work out how you sign certain swear words? <laughs> Poo. No, I'm not going to do another one. <laughs> I got a look. I thought I'm in trouble now. Right. Unbelievable e-commerce. That's what I'm, I'm supposed to be talking about today. And every, when I got asked to do this, in fact, every time I've been asked to do this talk, I've gone, really? Really? You want me to give this talk? Because to me, it just sounds like an awful kind of infomercial you'd see on American TV. Um, and, and I wrote, the, I wrote this, this the kind of outline for this presentation at a conference I didn't want to speak at, right? And so I thought, okay, I'm going to write this really salesy, kind of terrible, kind of marketing, aren't we wonderful outline that won't get accepted. And it got accepted. And actually, the presentation seemed to go down really well. So, um, but I was so embarrassed by it that I've had to change it, it quite regularly. And, and actually now, it's not, right? It's not this kind of horribly embarrassing thing that it, it may first appear to be, um, because they fired us, right? The client that I'm going to talk about today fired us relatively recently and I'll make I could make up all kinds of excuses as to why they fired us I would say things like well we just didn't want to grow to accommodate how big that they'd become because of the successful work we have did for them um, and bullshit like that but basically they decided after eight years to move on fair enough so this isn't a sales pitch um, it's actually a case study it's a case study really in our experience of, of working on an e-commerce site over a period of, of, of eight years. In fact, the case study I'm going to look at today um, covers a period of five years. And the reason that I've picked those particular five years is because after that, they were going, hang on a minute, this e-commerce, this is working. And so they started pouring huge amounts of money into marketing and advertising and stuff that we, we didn't influence. So those kinds of things, the growth that they received from that wasn't really down to us, so I haven't included that in here. But basically it's a case study, but it's not a case study that really is only applicable to those of you that work on e-commerce sites. I'm hoping that there's stuff that kind of applies to everybody. Um, a lot of the success isn't down to, to us and, and to my work, um, it's down to other people and I'm going to talk about that as well. Okay, so, but I feel like I need to embrace this infomercial thing, right? So, we have, no lie, created a 10,000% increase in e-commerce sales over five years. It's incredible. Let me say that again, that's 10,000% increase in only five years. And I know what you're thinking, this sounds suspicious. How could he possibly have achieved 10,000% in only five years? Well, you might be saying 10,000 is easy if you start from a low base. If you're only making one pound per month from the website, 10,000% isn't such a, a big increase. You might be thinking, well, they must site, sell high value goods to a tech savvy audience that has a lot of disposable income. There's a trick here, isn't there, ladies and gentlemen? You know it you know that this is too good to be true, don't you? How could you believe this? Well, you are wrong, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this really is as good as it gets in the world of e-commerce. Because we started from a reasonable... Be now, I have to say, actually, they fired us. Do I give a shit? <laughs> yeah, um, I think the reasonable... Be I'm not supposed to say the figure, but screw it, they fired us. Um, <laughs> what are they going to do? Um, it was about £10,000, UK pounds per month, was what they, they were making when we started with them. So those of you that are good at maths can work out how much they're making now. So we started from a reasonable base, and they sell frozen ready meals, right? This is not high value goods here. <laughs> 
They're selling for an average of three to four pounds per meal. That's all that they're selling. Sorry, I can't be bothered to do the, the maths into your funny money. You know. <laughs> You've got plastic money. Who has plastic money? It's just weird. So, frozen ready meals they sell. And they sell it not to a tech savvy audience, but to the elderly, right? Just to, to make it clear, the average consumer of this product is over 80. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ah, yes, but surely their children buy the product. This is the child. <laughs> right? So these are not a tech-savvy audience. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to say, can you achieve the same thing? I can't keep this up. The chances are, no, you probably can't achieve the same thing. Right? There's no way you're going to be able to do this. A 10,000% increase over ten year, uh, five years was a, a little bit of a fluke, maybe. But I do think that there are lessons that we can learn. Stuff that I've kind of taken away from working on that site that applies, I think, to a lot of stuff that we do. And actually, I think there is a lot we can learn together about, um, about how to build successful websites and what's actually involved in that. And I think there are less lessons in two areas, really. The first is a kind of lessons in business and design and the relationship between business and design. But maybe more specifically, what we're, we're actually talking about here um, is is that relationship between the client and the designer and how those two things work together. So that's kind of what we're going to look at. We're going to look at business and we're going to look at design and how the two kind of sit together and how those interactions and relationships work. So, if I could give one simple formula to the success of, um, of this um, uh, uh, website, it would be this. I'm going to pause so they can swap. And then it's nice, it's easy that way. It's still going, because I'm still talking, you see. So, I can... <laughs> so if I keep talking fast enough, they're not going to be able to swap over, and they're going to just keep going forever and ever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so if there's one simple formula for success, it would be this, work together that you and your client have to work together to have that kind of phenomenal success that, that we had over those five years. It was because of the relationship between me and the lead guy at that company that it worked. And that was down to him, really. Was, you know, he, he was just a brilliant client, and it worked so well. So, let's start off by looking at the business lessons that I learned from this website, and what we can maybe take away. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that all of this was planned and clever and we kind of worked it all out. It wasn't. It's just kind of how the project worked, all right? So I'm not trying to sound smug here or clever, all right? I'm just trying to share with you some of the things that worked well for us on that particular project, and hopefully it applies to you as well. First of all, it's, it's absolutely crucial that the client is an integral part of the process. And I think that for me, this whole kind of business thing, really what I'm sharing you is things that I've learned from Matty Curry, who is the, our client, Matt Curry. And I learned so much from that guy. And I think the client has so much to bring to the table, and yet often we don't really make use of that. We, don't, we think of the client as a moron, <laughs> um, when actually they've got a lot to contribute. First thing I learned from Matt, and, and we kind of discovered together, is that you are unique, right? In e-commerce terms, this means explaining to a lot of clients, and probably to yourself as well, that in actual fact, you are not Amazon. We are not Amazon. Why does every e-commerce site want to be Amazon? And we get that all the time, don't we, where some, a client comes to us and says, we want to be like so-and-so, can you build me Facebook? You know the kind of thing? And we're not anybody else, and in the case of this particular client, it was very true. They had a very unique audience, right? This wasn't an Amazon user base. This was a unique audience where the average consumer was in their 80s. 
And that had certain consequences on the design of the site. For a start, the, this was an audience that, although they were reasonably competent on the internet, lacked confidence, right? They didn't believe that they were doing it right. And so it was really necessary to kind of have a re really strong help section that was there to support them. And you know that people say, oh, if you need help, then the website isn't built right, right? That's bollocks. The truth is some people want that reassurance and this audience was one. So we had a big telephone number plastered all over the place. They didn't often use it, but they liked to know it was there. So um, other things that was unique about this audience. Now this is a bit of a sensitive one. This is constant turnover and I was thinking, how do I put this? <laughs> they tended to die. Now, I'm hoping that wasn't down to the frozen ready meals, <laughs> but just natural old age. But we did have quite a high turnover <laughs> of users. So it was really important that we supported new users well. And we had this, this big area on the site, um, you can see in the middle there, where we had this kind of quick start guide for new people because there was this high turnover and we had to accommodate that. Very different from Amazon, very specific to our audience. We also had to support carers as well. Um, and so there was all kinds of information about nutritional value and, and all these kinds of systems in place to support carers that were our secondary audience. So it wasn't just the audience that was a problem, there was also this franchise issue. Right? Now, I'm go now you're going to begin to understand why we managed 10,000% in five years. They had this franchise model. And what that meant was, is that each franchisee across the country could set their own prices. Can you see the problem here? How then can you show prices on the website for people to be able to purchase? Well, the previous web designer had a, a moment of inspiration in regards to this. He thought to himself, well, if all of the, um, if all of the prices are regional, what we need is people to give their postcodes so we know what region they're in. So what I'm going to do is on the home page of the site, I'm going to have a please enter your postcode box and you can't go any further into the site, see any of the products or do anything until you have given me your postcode. Immediate barrier to entry. So we, we took a very different approach with this. Um, and actually what we did is um, we allowed people to go in, we gave them the, a kind of the highest possible price it could be and then they got a pleasant surprise when they then had entered their postcode and it, you're told that you can get it cheaper. But also we kind of played up the whole postcode entry, entry thing to make, it, make them a, a, a local business where you have your personal driver and would have, you know, it would tell you which franchise you're in, you'd have a telephone number, not a national telephone number, but a local telephone number to your local driver. And these little old dears did love their local driver and there was a picture of their local driver and you had the name of the local driver and that kind of stuff. So it made it a friendly and approachable thing. So we took that barrier, that bad thing, that problem, and turned it into a positive. And it, well, I got really pissed off about all this, this, this um, pricing business. And I was like, I don't like this client. They've got a stupid business model. And I got all stroppy about it. But when I couldn't change it, actually, it turned out to be a positive thing. And I think more, more and more, we need to try and be more positive. OK. This is the next piece of business advice that I, I really learned. And again, it was Matt Curry that made me do this because I'm a sucker for anything new. Anything new and shiny and sexy I want to play with. That could have sounded better, couldn't it? Um, <laughs> but, um, but Matt really taught me not to do that. And you know what it's like. Over the time we worked with them, all of these things came along, right? There was all oh, we're gonna all oh, Ajax. Everything's got to be Ajaxed up to the you know up to the nines. Oh yes, exciting JavaScript Ajaxy stuff. Ooh, um, <laughs> and then and then it was all oh iPhones, iPads, native apps. Yes, all of this kind of stuff. And then there was oh we'll make a local air. Do you remember Air? Everybody played with Air for a while, and it was the in thing. I think we've got over it now. Um, you know, and so so there was all these things coming along, and we were getting excited about them. And, and Matt made me step back and really think about what I was doing. But we made some mistakes along the way. And one of them was with SEO. 
They took on an SEO company because, because somebody in higher management was very distressed that, that Wiltshire Farm Foods only came there in the list. And they completely buggered the website, to be frank. They filled it with keywords, they ruined it, right? They, sh they completely shagged the user experience. Shagged the user experience. Sorry. <laughs> I really should stop this. This isn't nice. I don't make friends this way. Right. So, you know, it's about kind of not jumping on the bandwagon. The other thing is, is I was like, oh, yeah, we've got this really cool website now. We can dump that printed brochure and save you all the cost of that. And, and Matt managed to talk me around to it. And actually, we ended up featuring the brochure really heavily on the website. Because a lot, lot, a lot of these people actually wanted the brochure. And what we found that they were doing is they were oh, they're going through their brochure, looking at all their coloured pictures, etc. And they were using the codes that were in the brochure. They were going along to the website and entering their, those codes into the search box. Okay? So actually, instead of trying to convince them they should all dump the brochure and come online, we actually accommodated that. And I'll, I'll show you some of that later on. The other thing that we learnt um, is how important with this audience, visiting their users in the home was, and actually doing user testing in their home. I'll give you two examples of why this was so massively important. All right? Example number one is we did proper usability when we were grown up. We got proper usability testing. We had, we had a very expensive usability lab with two you know, one-way mirrors and video cameras and all of this stuff, and lovely big desktop setup, desktop computer, big monitor, mouse, keyboard, you know, all the works ready to come in. These little old ladies came in, because the men had all died by this point. <laughs> um, and the little old lady sat down, and one after another, we were doing, we did eight on that day, and one after another, that was it. That was as far as we got in the usability testing. Them sitting down, right? Now, the reason for this is because that whole generation have skipped a whole stage of web browsing. They've been given laptops by their children, right? What do laptops have? Trackpads. None of the eight people that we tested knew how to use a mouse. End of the usability testing. So after that utter disaster, we decided we were going to go into their homes because then they'd be using whatever they use on their homes. So it was all going great. And we went in. It was brilliant because you'd be there for about three hours chatting about the war. Um, and <laughs> no, which was seriously good. One of these guys was a World War II pilot. And I didn't give a sod about the usability testing. It was far more interesting listening to his experiences of the Battle of Britain. But anyway, when we did manage to get these people sitting down to actually do some usability testing after we'd had copious cups of tea, um, they, they, uh, I remember with one lady, I sat down next to her and I said, OK, what I want you to do now is I want you to add this item to the shopping basket. OK. And as I said the words, I knew this is going to be a disaster. All right. And sure enough, she pressed the button and, and the shopping basket, basket, I presume, updated. The reason I say I presume updated is because we had the shopping basket tethered in the top right-hand corner of the website, over which she had a post-it note of her daughter's telephone number. <laughs> so we had no idea whether the... And she had no idea where the shopping basket was, and it was a disaster. So as she's seen these people in the home, not only do you see the real environments that real people use the internet, but you also got to know them a little bit. Just looking around their house, it was like an episode of Through the Keyhole. You got a sense of who these people were a lot more than taking them into a lab. But testing became a kind of intrinsic part of our process. We were testing continually and iterating off of the back of that. Matt was obsessed with analytics and statistics. He did an um, economics degree. Um, and so he, he would just do amazingly disturbing things with Google Analytics. Um, and, uh, and we would iterate off of the back of that and test off of that back, back of that in a continual cycle. You know, and it's really an ongoing investment. And I think we need to push our clients to allow us to test. And I know it's not always easy, but we need to be trying to do it. We need to be um, doing regular user testing. And we, we were, became obsessed with multivariant testing. If we weren't sure, we'd try it. I mean, I remember one time where um, on the e-commerce site, you know how it's that little, at the bottom it says VeriSign. 
You have the VeriSign logo. Everything's okay if the VeriSign logo's there. And I, I was going, does anybody know what that means? Right? I know, let's, let's do some little tests. And so we try one with a padlock and one with a combination of text and all these different things to kind of say the website's secure. Out of those tests, we tested a load of different multivariants, a load of different ones, and we actually caused a 6% increase in conversions just by check, getting rid of that stupid logo that's advertising for Ver uh, VeriSign and nothing doesn't communicate any information. So testing, multivariant testing, analytics, all of that stuff is so, so important, and yet we skip by it so often. Also, another key to the success of Wiltshire Farm Foods, um, which is the company, um, is the, the fact that I, you know, it's stuff that I was nothing to do with. And I think oftentimes we need to look above and beyond the website. Okay, we're web designers, we're responsible for the website, but unless we really understand their businesses and really understand the cool stuff that they do and communicate that clearly through the website, you know, we miss out, miss a trick. You know, these guys were competing with the big supermarket chains, so why would you buy from this company rather than the big, you know, super, supermarket campaign? Well, it's the fact that these, these guys kind of went above and beyond in their service. They offered cash on delivery. They had an email 24-7 helpline. They had Facebook um, text. They had police checked drivers, which if you're a, a, I mean, an old lady living by yourself, you're worried about who these strange people are turning up at your door. You know, they had unpacking where the people would come in and unpack all of the food for you. You could reorder from the driver at the door, which was horrible for our statistics on our website, because the first order would be placed on the website and that would it. We'd lose them because the, the driver had chat them up and they'd order on the door. But that was okay because that was part of their value uh, added service. They were always, they would, they, these guys would, would deliver through hurricanes and you know bad weather and all of that kind of stuff. You would have the same driver week in and week out that would check on them, you know, etc. And those are just the official things. And there was the things like, you know, taking little old ladies to hospital because they found that the lady's broken a wrist when they've gone round and things like that. So they were, they were absolutely an amazing service and we needed to kind of reflect that on the website and what we did, you know, what we, um, what we were showing. The other thing was establishing a good working, don't read, <laughs> listen to me, don't read the screen. <laughs> um, how many, this was a real conversation. Because because Matt was just obsessed with money, 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 money. And he just considered me some kind of liberal kind of, you know, socialist or something. So we used to have this banter. We had this really good working relationship. And it's taking the time to establish that good working relationship is so, so important in the relationship between you and the client. And the success of the website, if you don't have, interestingly, when Matt moved on to go and work selling sex toys, I'm not kidding you, he went from delivering old, um, frozen meals to old people to selling vibrators and dildos. But <laughs> when he moved on and we continued working with them, the relationship didn't work as well. The website did a dildo. <laughs> so I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Don't swear at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh God, get me out of here. Um, I can't help myself, I've got no impulse control. Um, so, uh, yeah, good working relationship. Right, so that's the kind of businessy side of things. But let's look at design for a minute and some of the design uh, changes that we made. How are we doing time-wise, by the way, Sean? I'm fine. I'm fine. Am I, how long rest left? Ten more minutes, okay, I should be, yeah, that's, that's nowhere near enough. Right, design. <laughs> that's good. Right, so in other words, or, or what the designer brings to the table. We talk very much about what the client brings to the table, but what does the designer bring to the table? Well, that first thing I think we really brought is we removed clutter. Oh, that's better. Thank you very much. Right, I'll slow right down then. Yeah, so we brought, um, yeah, we moved clutter from the website. That was a big thing that we did and we spent a lot of time doing that. They had this, this horrendous problem 
of their categories. You see these categories down the left hand menu? All right? They had hundreds of categories of different types. I never knew there were so many categories for food. Um, and they had, you know, um, all these kind, of, and they forever expanded as well, and more and more were added on an almost daily basis. And, and these were in their brochure and in all their print material, and so we had no control over them. So what we did is we started applying the laws of simplicity. Have you ever read the book, Laws of Simplicity? Absolutely brilliant book, get it. And there are, there are three principles. He talks about remove stuff if you can. If you can't remove it, then um, shrink it or hide it. Make it small or hide it away. And so what we did is we went with the, the hide it approach. So what we did is we looked at who were the big sellers. Because there were certain categories that sold way, way above the rest. Um, and we focused on those and we hid the rest away. Um, and we were starting to remove clutter and simplify the website. Another area we did it in is with um, uh, the, the product listings. The product listings were full of all kinds of stuff. They were full of ratings and reviews and you could star stuff and you could all this stuff and, and it got really cluttered. And so we simplified it right, right down to the bare minimum that we could get away with. So we, we spent a lot of time removing clutter from the website. And you remember earlier I said about how a, little, a lot of these um, women like to um, um, look through the brochure and then take the product codes and put them in search? So what we started to do, we thought, okay, well, there's this whole group of people that really doesn't want the website. They just want to get the food, all right? They know what they want and they want to order it. So what we did is we created a separate site for them, um, which was this. And this is kind of minimalistic web design to the, to the extreme, really, where you just enter your house number and your postcode and um, you go through from there and you just type in your, your product codes and how many you wanted and um, you add them to your order and it kind of builds up into, um, you can check that you've got the right thing, obviously, and it just builds up and then you go through and you check out. Simple, clean, none of the clutter, none of the rest of it, just focusing down on what the user wanted to do at any particular time. So that was, removing clutter was a big part. Another area where we spent a lot of time is on the, on the shopping cart. Um, we put a lot of focus and a lot of effort into that because that was a kind of key point of drawing, drawing the user's attention to the most important stuff, basically. Um, so we, did a, we, did, we got a bit carried away, really, in this, this regard. Um, so for a start, what we did is um, we, we put the, um, the shopping basket in the top right-hand corner and it had a different colour button that pulled it out. Um, I know this isn't a particularly pretty site, but there are, there are reasons for that. So we pulled the, 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 the um, shopping basket out, we made it very prominent. Other things that we did is we tethered it to the top so as the user starts scrolling it remains in the same position and it's always viewable, presuming you haven't got a post-it note over it. Um, and um, so we put a lot of effort into those kinds of things. We also provided a lot of visual feedback. And this was a huge thing because as I said this audience lacked confidence. So they wanted to know that they'd done it right, all right? That they'd done the right thing and it was all going to plan and everything was okay. And again, we got a little bit carried away with this. So here's a video um, which shows you me adding a product, right? So count how many visual cues you get. One, it moves up. Two, it appears in the shopping basket up there. Boop, little animation. Three, the box then gets, um, gets changed. It's now got an outline, one in the box. The, the button itself changes to add another and goes yellow. So we like, yes, you have added it to the basket. <laughs> Hello? Do I need to speak up? You know, so we really kind of rammed that message home. And we were doing that throughout the site. You know, we were obviously doing um, positive reinforcement as well when you're filling in forms, making sure that you say, yeah, you have put in your email address, my love. You know, you don't, you're doing well. <laughs> I can be rude about this audience now because I don't work for the client anymore, so screw them. <sighs> my gran would be appalled. Right, um, so yeah. Um, and so you were kind of, you know, lots of pos positive reinforcement. The other thing that I think was really important with e-commerce sites generally, but I think particularly with, um, well, no, I think gen websites generally, I think it's, this is an important fact, but e-commerce sites in particular is big product shots, right? There's been a lot, and I think big is generally good when it comes to the web. 
you can get carried away, as, as I'm sure Jeffrey Zellman at the moment would, would confess with his, his font sizes, bless him. Well, he's like me, he's kind of getting older bits. You, you know, you need everything bigger, don't you, as you age. Um, <laughs> I love Jeffrey. Um, so big product shots were a big thing for this audience. So uh, again, we did this big grid thing that you can see going on here um, with nice big pictures in, associated with them. Um, then also, we also got you know, these, these highlighted ones that are extra big. If you roll over any one of these and click, you go through to a product detail with a bigger image. And then if you really want to go for it, we make it massive um, and filling as much of the screen as possible. And I think when it comes to e-commerce in particular, showing good quality shots, good quality product shots is so, so important. Um, and I don't think many e-commerce sites do it particularly well. Apparently now I'm logging into a different Wi-Fi network. That's good. And actually, Wiltshire Farm Foods spent a lot of money making this food look good. Now, I need to explain how big an achievement that was. <laughs> because some of their meals, right, were kind of almost medical. <laughs> in the sense that they were kind of pureed. Right? So this is like grey goop. And what they actually did, they would puree, this is brilliant, they would puree carrots, okay, and then they would mould that puree back into the shape of a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> they would! It was awesome! Um, and and they, they, therefore, the, the photographs didn't look too bad. Now, I said earlier that, that the, it wasn't the most pretty sight in the world. And one of the reasons why this site isn't the most pretty site in the world, even though it performs well, is because we always put usability and, uh, and um, business objectives above design aesthetics. Right? Sure, it's slightly embarrassing showing off this website to some people because it's not the nicest website, especially when you're showing off to your peers. But to be honest, you lot don't matter a shit. Right? <laughs> you're not the people we're trying to impress. And there were two areas our designer, our designer wanted, he wanted to make something lovely, bless him. Right? He, was really, you know, he had pride in his work. And there was one area where, time and time again, he'd try and creep stuff past us, thinking we wouldn't notice. And every time we had to pull him up back on it, and it was this. Make buttons look like buttons, and links look like friggin' links. What is it with designers? I'm going to do a subtle border bottom dotted light grey, and that will signify it's a link. And that's all you need. <laughs> it's a bit pointless for me doing that, isn't it, right? Um, and so we ended up with, you know, screens like this. It's a link! <laughs> but it, it's really important. Because not everybody's like us. And we tend to forget that. It's a button! I noticed the buttons as well. You know, they, that's the real, I don't know whether you noticed this, but it's the great difference between um, Windows and Macs, the operating systems. That, that, you know, Windows have buttons like OK and Cancel, which is great if you read all the other text around it. I don't know whether this might change now, but yeah, it's great if you read all the text around it. But if you just read the button, OK and Cancel tells you nothing, right? So what all our buttons did would say, yes, please try and receive my, uh, retrieve my details, or no, I have not purchased from this website before. So we're kind of making it very obvious what those buttons stand for in their own rights. Another thing that was really crucial from the design process is be there to help. Do you remember I was saying about how they lack confidence? And so we wanted to be there at every stage to kind of support our users through it. So we did have this help section, which had a big prominent phone number. Um, that was there screaming at you. But we did other stuff as well. We did this quick start guide that I mentioned that kind of guided them through, you know, really basic stuff like choose a meal, place an order, get it free. You know, but this audience kind of needed that kind of detail to it. And then also we added, I mean, look at all this crap, right? <laughs> Nobody reads, you said this, Nobody reads text on the internet. Old ladies do. Seriously! In fact, your problem is if you put too much text on the screen, they'll read it all, right? It takes them about five hours to progress three screens. 
So actually, they're one of the... <laughs> oh, I'm really rude to these people. Um, you know, they, they, they will read all this stuff. And it, the, the text is not perfect in that particular example, but... Um, you know, and we had help on every page where they can go off and be rescued at any stage if they feel needs to be. And then finally, handling errors um, gracefully was a really important part. And again, you know, some of our, our um, error messages, you know, oh dear, we've got a problem, let's fix it, right? It wasn't 404 error! <laughs> your HTTP protocol is up your wazoo! You know... And, and again, loads of text, because we know that if, in, in, with this audience, that if they're struggling, if they get stuck, they want help. They want thorough help that tells them exactly what to do and how to do it. Remember, you're not Amazon. Not all websites are the same. You hear these things. People talk in very black and white terms at conferences. You should do this. You should do that. This is best practice. That's best practice. But ultimately, it's about your audience and accommodating them. Um, and then with, with, with search, we, we got people putting all kinds of the weirdest stuff in search. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it was so ridiculous that we, you know, we didn't even try and work out what the hell they were actually after. And so they'd get this screen instead, where we, we kind of really lay out very clearly what you can put in, how you can do it, how it can work. You know, down to hit the enter key on your keyboard or click the button with your mouse. Because the other thing with this audience is that a lot of them have motor control problems. So actually knowing that you could hit the enter key rather than try and move that trackpad onto something was really useful to them. I tell you, if you ever do work with an elderly audience, here's a real tip, right? When you design a user interface, when you've got it up and running, put on a pair of ski gloves and try using the site. It's a very good way of kind of replicating arthritis and if you can use the site with a pair of ski gloves on, you're probably doing all right. Right. Um, and then the big other thing we did with the, with the design is um, uh, communicate added value. So this is where we, you know, we went into these things about we actually deliver it to your door, we'll bring it in, we'll unpack it for you. We provided all, you know, really exposed all of that stuff and made it very obvious. So really that's it. It's about business and design working in partnership. We need to get over this fact that the, you know, we kind of feel that the client doesn't have stuff to contribute to the process. They really, really do. They have a lot to contribute and we need to accept that. Equally, clients need to realise the value of the design and what we bring together, uh, to the table. And when you get those two people, the designer and the client, working as peers together, a partnership working on the site together, it can lead to some quite stunning results. And I am very proud, I'm very proud of the fact that over those five years, we increased their sales by 10,000%. And I'm very proud of the fact they actually fired us. The fact that they outgrew us, that we were no longer bigger for them. That's where you want to get to with your clients, don't you? Where they kind of, it's like having a child that grows up and flies the nest. And that, you know, and when that relationship works well, it is transforma you know, it's just transforms what would be a good site into a stunning site. And really, that's what I wanted to leave you with. So it's, you know, from the business point of view, it's recognising that you're unique, not being caught up in whatever the latest thing is. My, my nephew is, thinks Facebook's cool, we need a Facebook page, even though our, you know, our audience never uses Facebook. So avoid sexy, visit users in their home. If you ever get the chance to do that, do it. Even if you're not being paid by the client to do it, do it anyway. Don't just turn up, you know, do arrange it. But if you get the opportunity, really do that. Test and iterate and go beyond the site and look at the, the business as a whole and what they bring to the table and what benefits they've got and get that right relationship. Invest in that right relationship. I got, went out and got drunk with Matt more times than I'm willing to admit and, and just building that kind of personal relationship is so good. And then from a, a design point of view, remove your clutter. Um, if it's an e-commerce site, focus on the cart, but that can equally be focus on your calls to action. You know all of this stuff, but so often mid-project it gets lost. And I see my job here today is just to remind you of what you already know. Provide feedback um, wherever possible to your users. Use big product shots, big imagery, big type. Um, make your buttons obvious, be there to help. 
handle error as well, and communicate value. And that is basically it. Thank you very much, guys. So we should time. We've got some questions. We've got 10 minutes for questions. Wow, I've been super efficient. It's because he said he wanted to try and catch up time, so I went a bit faster than I normally would. Anybody got any questions? Yes. I said, change it to blue standard links. Do it now. I don't care about your... No. Um, I've, I've got a good... Ed is the designer on that project. I've got a really good working relationship with Ed, and he is a superb designer. And it's the kind of role that we have, right? I, you know, his job is to push for aesthetic beauty. Right? That's what he's always pushing towards. I'm the one, the boring sod, that's always saying, got to be sensible, got to be sensible, got to be sensible. And we do just spar against one another. And that's kind of how it works. And, and sometimes he wins and sometimes I win. And you know, in, in that particular case, all you needed to do is show him one usability session and he kind of caved, basically. You know, and you would, you know, he's not an unreasonable guy. So he didn't take massive you know, um, convincing, to be honest. Any more for any more? One down there? Yeah, I've got the mic for you. All right. Sorry, I should have repeated your question because you didn't have the mic. Can you uh, briefly just, um, what's your setup as far as um, setting the expectations as far as working with a client from a design perspective? Um, like I, I have my own little small little design shop and um, you know, you start off skeptical. They come to you solving a business problem and you're obviously using design as a solution for them. Yeah. Now, how do you get them on board where they're, they're like, okay, put your business hat aside, let's you know, work together with yeah. what I do. So we're yeah. a team, because you hear that a lot today with working as a team with your client. Uh -huh. uh, I've written an excellent book on that subject called Client-Centric Web Design. I'll give you a fiver afterwards for, for bringing that up, thank you. Um, <laughs> Where I tackle these kinds of issues about that relationship between you and the client, and there's a, there's a whole talk in that. But um, the, the, the keys is from the very beginning, treat it as a peer to peer relationship. And I mean, even when you're pitching, don't, don't go in, yes, sir, no, sir. Oh, that's a very English thing. Um, you know, don't go in as a servant, go in as an equal. Go in as somebody that, you know, okay, I see where you're coming from, but actually I think we ought to do this. Don't agree to stuff that you're not happy with. Just go in as an equal partner. So that's part of it. Also, then engage them through the entire process. So we have this very collaborative working relationship through design. So we'll sit down and we'll, you know, look at inspirational sources together. We'll mood board together. We'll wireframe together. They're actually in the room while I'm doing that, or we're doing that kind of stuff. So that it's not a situation of, okay, you have passed your brief down from on high, the Ten Commandments of this project. I, your servant, shall go away and I shall, you know, go into my room and, and you know, produce this beautiful design and then go, ta-da! You know, because the trouble is with that scenario is that the client feels no sense of ownership over it. They don't feel it's their design. They don't, don't understand why you've done what you've done. So you've got to lead them through the process from the very beginning. So check out client-centric web design. Yep. That's a short 10 minutes. You're trying to steal time, aren't you? <laughs> Who have we got? Better be good. Last question. Pressure's on. How do you go about getting into people's homes? <laughs> <laughs> good last question. I mean, actually, in this particular case, it was extremely difficult because you can imagine, uh, you know, um, elderly people living by themselves, you know, quite, quite an uncomfortable situation. So um, what I'd recommend um, is that First of all, I didn't go in without the client. It was one of those situations that client, having the client at usability testing is usually a good thing because they wake up and realise what the world's really like. But occasionally you don't want to. But in this case, it was right. We needed the client with us because they had the official Wiltshire Farm Foods badge and all the rest of it. And he was police checked as well, which made a big difference. Um, you joke, but it does make a big difference to these people. So it was something that the client arranged. Um, and normally a client does have certain people that are tame customers. 
you know, the, the, the ones that are always writing in and say, oh, the beef pie is not as nice as it used to be. So these are people that do want to kind of contribute and do be involved. So most of the time your client can set that up for you. Um, uh, but yeah, it's not always easy. Not always easy, I, I fully admit that. Okay, well, thank you very much, guys. Hope it was useful. <laughs>